The agenda this week compared notes on women in politics, examined the progression of freedom of information laws, looked at how freedom of speech is shifting in the digital era, and met the novelist who reimagined an historic path to freedom. The agenda's week in review begins with the prospects for electoral reform in Canada. Should we bring in a proportional representation system whereby if you get 40% of the votes, you get 40% of the seats. Okay, so I'm glad you brought this up because my concern about this whole exercise is what is the problem we're trying to solve? Mm -hmm. Is the problem, as you say, that you have a disproportionate amount of power to the, to the popular vote, or is the problem that we have a, um, a large, um, sparsely populated country uh, with uh, a party system that has more than, more than two parties involved? Whenever you have more than two parties, you're, going, you're, you're not going to be able to just mathematically get that 50% seat. So is the problem really the electoral system, or is it the party system? Uh, if you go to proportional representation, there are costs and benefits to that. Certainly a benefit is that your House of Commons looks more like the, the popular vote. The cost of that is that it's going to just have, uh, it's going to give incentives for smaller parties to emerge. And so you're going to end, so if you don't like the five party system, you might end up with a 10 party system. So coalition governments, as far as the eye can see, probably. That, that is a, a high, higher chance, higher probability of coalition governments, higher and also a higher probability of smaller parties emerging because they're rewarded to do so in a proportional representation as opposed to um, first past the post. So Marie. Those are, the, those are the costs and benefits. Sure. Uh, but one of the benefits is also that you will have better representation from unrepresented groups. You could have more women on the list, for example, if they went to a, a list system and a, or a partial representative system. Mm -hmm. You could have people, more First Nations representatives. and You can have people that right now are disenfranchised politically. You could so have that's a lot one more, of the benefits. Uh, you could have a lot more white supremacists as well. You can, but the, that's democracy. And if that's, well, look what happens south of the border. I mean, that's democracy. And that's a message in itself that they're unhappy with the present government. I don't think in Canada that would happen, she says. Who knows if I'll be proven wrong in 10 years. But I do know that when we were undergoing this exercise in Ontario, people would stop me in the streets and say, Marie, in Hamilton especially where I lived, we heard you on TV talking about this voting thing. What the hell were you talking about? <laughs> it's not an easy thing to explain to people. So yes, you have to properly educate people before you ask them to vote. Have you come down one way or another over the years after looking at it in so many different ways and writing, I'm sure, dozens of columns about this issue? Have you planted your flag somewhere? On a particular model of reform? Yes. Mm -hmm. I tend to prefer the single transferable vote, the oh, system, to, system explain of... Explain what that is. It's just a system of multi-member ridings and with, with a transferable vote to decide between the candidates. All proportional I'm sorry, system. I don't know what that means. Well, <laughs> I'll, Say that I'll again. get to you in a second. Yeah, okay. All proportional systems involve multi-member writings instead of one-member writings. So right now we have a system where if you get the, if you have the largest block of votes in a writing, even if it's only 30 percent, then you get all of the representation of that writing. So only your party's views get represented in Parliament. Proportional systems, the, the building block of them is multi-member writing, so that if you get, let's say you have five members in writing, if you get 20% of the vote, you get one of those five. If you get 40%, you get two of those five. Mm -hmm. So you're dividing up the representation that more represents the, the range of views in that writing, and then if you sum it over all the writings in the parliament as a whole. Uh, the single transferable vote is the idea of you rank the, the, the candidates one, two, three, four, five, not hard to do, and then the counting is sort of similar to the way that we've always done party leadership contests, where the, the bottom candidate after each round drops out and he crosses the floor. We, we've all seen those scenes. Except you do it with a ranked ballot, that's all done in the counting. You don't have to have s serial rounds of, of mm. voting. You're all doing it by just marking down so one. So the lowest one drops off and those votes are redistributed. Are redistributed. But that's, you know, that's getting into the weeds of, of, of the counting, which you know people always like to say, oh, this is so complicated. I don't know how my car works, but I know how to drive my car. <laughs> <laughs> the, for, for the voter, all they need to know is you mark your ballot one, two, three. It's not that hard. So uh, we, we just heard Marie say, constituents came up to her all the time saying, Marie, what the hell are you talking about? And yet you think this can be made to work, a big national electoral education exercise. How come? Well, because that's what most countries in Western democracies are doing, and, it, and they're all doing it just fine. We're actually the only OECD country that uses first past the post universally for all of our elections. Like, we're very obscure and fringe in the way that we exercise our democracy. And you, you just mentioned the US election where they elected Donald Trump. We all know that two million people voted for uh, Hillary Clinton. Two million more. Yeah, sorry, two million more <laughs> uh, voted three. for close to yeah. three. That keeps going up. So whereas we look at, at Europe, we know that uh, France is gonna be having a runoff. Austria just had a, a, a runoff. Uh, this week, and as Andrew mentioned, 
every party in Canada uses runoffs to choose not only their leaders, but their candidates in all 338 ridings. The Conservative Party and the New Democrats are both choosing a leader this year using a ranked ballot. So somehow it works for all of Europe, it works for the parties, but somehow for voters it'll be so complicated to, to change to a new system. It's actually really patronizing hmm. to the average Canadian to say that they won't understand the system that all of Europe is using. Caught on video in the audio recording, Rob Ford can clearly be heard talking about opposing mayoral candidate and once political ally Karen Stintz. And, you know, you can read the next part there. Ford could clearly be heard saying. How does one even go into work the next day when this is all over the newspapers? It was awkward. It, it was quite awkward. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there was, uh, how do you respond to something like that? And it, I, I, I honestly, I, I didn't even know how to do it. It was just, it was, it was embarrassing and appalling. And, I, and now suddenly that became the story. And every time I was in front of the media, well, is, did, ha, has Rob Ford apologized? Will you accept his apology? And so suddenly I'm now wrapped up in this thing that I'm like, I, I don't even know how this, I don't even know how I became part of this story. Well, you had nothing to do with it, really. Yeah. And so it, it is, um, I mean, th that, that was an unfortunate part of, um, you know, being a woman in politics, because certainly had I been a man, I don't think he would have said that. Well, no, it's also, it's also about who has more power. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a female talking about sex or uh, would have the kind of hurtful power that line has. So the status quo, i.e. power, men, can actually hurt women, candidate, a lot mm -hmm. more using various strategy because of those, that kind of language. We heard, and, and, and a lot of, in terms of our language, we don't have that many tools on our toolbox to insult people. Not that we need to or want well, to. Well, I was going to say, I've never heard a female candidate, you know, use a vulgar sexual metaphor to try to demean um, a male counterpart. No, no, but I mean, again, again, so this is not... I don't expect that Rob thought that was going to be in the public domain, you know. And again, the media had a choice of whether they wanted to air that, and it was they could they could have chosen not to, because he wasn't at a press conference. He didn't say it as part of you know he was at a bar. Presumably, he was drinking. He was talking to a bartender who taped him right. surreptitiously. So you know there was a question for me: like, why is this a story? They had a choice to not make it a story because. It, it, it is a story because he, if he said it to anyone, it could be about my daughter, anybody, it's, it's uh, outrageous in itself. It's awkward. It's well, not it's, awkward. It's, I think it's hate. Yeah. And hate needs to be called out. It's a sexist statement, and it's hateful and hurtful, but I, no matter who he's yeah. talking about. But again, I think it was, to your point, I think it was more damaging. I mean, I didn't, certainly didn't lose the campaign because of that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of it was more damaging to me because that story will follow me around mm -hmm. and long after I'm, I've left politics. And so it, for me, it was that he said it was unfortunate, that it was aired and became a story, was really, for me, um, where yeah. the, the problem lay. But there's no question that when, when, when you're in the political realm, frequently, not mm -hmm. always, the criticism of a female, whether it's being done by a male or a female, does tend to be done more in sexual gender-type yeah. yeah. terms, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, well, we saw the Trump tape during the it, campaign. That's right. And and um, uh, CBC Television uh, recently ran uh, a very good story where they had some of the women members of Parliament read some of the things that uh, had been tweeted about them or tweeted to them or that whatever. Was very powerful. It, very powerful. And you know, and the B word. You know, am I allowed to say bitch on TV? I think you just did. I think I you just did. You can't say the C word. <laughs> no, but, I can't but say the C word. That was included as well. That's right. And so so and yet when you looked at what how they went after Chris Alexander, mm -hmm. it wasn't in sexual terms. I mean, he had mm -hmm. very, it was very personal. It was meant to hurt him. It was meant to be demeaning to him, all of those things, things, but it wasn't done in sexual tones. So there's no question, people go after politicians, male or female, and there, there is a stream in the body politic that does try to hurt you, uh, demean you, uh, question your motives, like all the time, but with women, 
it does tend to happen in a, in a sort of sexual it gender. It has a, a, a violent sexual connotation it is, to this, it. Now it is, yeah. Have you, have you experienced any of that? Nothing. I mean, you know, my staff may have never showed it to me. Uh, yeah. And remember, though, too, I mean, I left politics, you know, I lost the election in 2003. And the, that whole social media universe is mm -hmm. very different now. And what it is, in my view, what it is doing is it is taking the shackles off human beings. I mean, there's a reason we have civilization. It's to keep us all under control. And <laughs> social media... Is the most antisocial form. Form, yeah, I think it, I've it ever gets experienced. rid of those controls. Yeah, yeah. So you're seeing raw human beings, if you will. You know, journalists are supposed to be very dispassionate in the way they cover events. They're not supposed to have, you know, an ax to grind or a dog in the hunt, as the expression goes. Uh, in which case, should they, in your view, be advocating for a better functioning, more open access to information law in the country? Absolutely. Um, look, you know, democracy and freedom of information is a precondition for a well-functioning news media, for a well-functioning fourth estate. And I think in this country, Canadian journalists have not been the advocates they should have been uh, when it comes to freedom of information. That's because they're not supposed to advocate. Yeah, well, if you compare the history of freedom of information in the United States to the history of freedom of information in Canada, you see a lot more journalism activism around freedom of information, pushing the government to get information, pushing the government to introduce freedom of information laws than you do here in Canada. And in fact, um, at least some news organizations down in the United States make explicit exemptions in their ethics codes that allow journalists to advocate on these kinds of issues. NPR is very explicit about that. In fact, the public radio uh, network down in the United States, they say journalists in the United States should be able to advocate for freedom of information, freedom of expression. Because if we don't have those things, then how are we going to do our jobs? And if we aren't advocating, then who exactly is going to advocate? Well, There's let me find that out from Jamie. Jamie, yeah. do, do, you, do you take a political position on this? A absolutely. Now more than ever, what is most important uh, is, is robust, fact-based journalism. I mean, we just came off an election in the United States where uh, fake news uh, was all over the place. And uh, the Oxford Dictionary has just coined the term post-truth. 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 That's a new thing. And. Um, Look, these documents that you can obtain through this process are the original documents. No one can spin, spin you. This isn't what the government is choosing to release. This is um, a, a physical uh, record of what has happened in, in our government bodies. And so I don't, I don't even think it should be a question of whether or not we should be advocating for, for this. This helps us uh, as journalists do our job better. Suzanne Legault, I want to get a better understanding from you. Which of the following sentences better characterizes your view on this? Uh, th this law might have been fine 30 years ago, but we've outgrown it, and it's got to be so much better today, and we're really entitled to much more information than we're getting. Or, you know, it's still pretty amazing how much information we managed to get out of our governments, all of these complaints notwithstanding. <laughs> Can I choose both? Because <laughs> I think both agree. I mean, both are good. Um, you know, we do need to change our legislation. And it's, you know, in Canada, the Supreme Court of Canada has recognized from 1997 that access to information is fundamental to the exercise of our democratic rights. And it's really fundamental for citizens to hold their governments to account. Later, in 2010, the Supreme Court of Canada has also decided that access to information is a derivative right uh, found in Section 2B of the Canadian Charter of Rights that protects freedom of expression. So we have a well-entrenched and recognized right to information in Canada. Now, it's important that we have a modern framework that responds to our citizens today. I mean, that we've, we've, we're living a data revolution, and we have a legislation that was basically devised in the paper era. So I think it's really important that we modernize it. But we also have to look at it in the context of open government, which has also changed 
the importance of the right to information in 2016, right to information now is also linked to innovation and it's also linked to government efficiency. And the reason why that is, is because we want to have open governments by default where information is shared with citizens so that you can have an open dialogue, you can better develop programs and policies and services. So you create innovation and you create a better and more efficient and more responsive government to the needs of its citizens. So the actual reasons for right to information have also transformed with uh, the new technology and the new citizens' expectations. And so the more the reason to modernize our framework. Your book on free speech starts with the sentence, we are all neighbors now. Why is that a significant observation when talking about free speech? Because in the past, our neighbors were our neighbors, the street, the village, the town. And basically, the rule of thumb was, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. But in a world shaped by mass migration and the internet, there are people from everywhere in Rome and what people see in Rome can be heard and say in Rome can be heard and seen everywhere. Mm -hmm. Fantastic opportunity for free speech. Three billion people can broadcast directly to each other. Huge danger. What does this mean? It means a video called Innocence of Muslims is posted in California. People die in demonstrations in Pakistan and Afghanistan. A fatwa is spoken in Raqqa or Tehran. Journalists die in Paris. And so the question is, how do we maximize the opportunities and minimize the risks? You've called it an assassin's veto in some respects. What is that? So my argument is that one of the most uh, serious threats to free speech in the West today is people who say, if you say that, publish that, broadcast that, draw that, we will kill you. Mm. And then they actually do, as happened to the journalists of Charlie Hebdo in Paris. And this is the assassin's veto. And it's not just the people who get killed. It's also the chilling effect on a much, much wider area. I would argue, particularly around Islam, there is quite a lot of self-censorship out of fear. And that, I believe, we have to, one of the most important messages of the book, that we have to combat with all the means at our disposal. In which case, let me get your take on the following, which I'm going to read to you. This was written by a second year University of Toronto student in the Varsity, which is the newspaper on the U of T campus. And he writes the following, to turn the tides of colonial oppression, we must go beyond free speech to equitable speech. We must wake up, acknowledge our privileges, and in some cases, seed speech for ears towards the unprivileged. We must practice justice and democracy by enabling marginalized people to speak on their own terms, to assert their nuanced existences, and to self-determine their place in a post-colonial world. Not free speech, but equitable speech. What is your response to but that? But the but is quite wrong in that. It's free speech and equal speech. That goes all the way back to ancient Athens. Uh, they, they, their idea was everybody had an equal right to speak, all citizens. So. Where I agree with this student is that there are power relations in the whole world. of the, Not everybody gets to sit at this table, for mm. example. Mm. And we all, we who are, as it were, better placed, have a job to do trying to empower the voices of the weak, the powerless, and the marginalized. The problem comes, and it comes now in universities too, when people try to do that by banning speakers from campus, mm -hmm. saying, you can't speak. Uh, this happened recently to the famous feminist Germaine Greer. It's called rather like ugly word, no platforming. That is quite wrong. Everything we do to enable and empower voices, I'm uh, unconditionally for. Everything we do to mm -hmm. ban and close down speech, I think we, also in universities, should be absolutely resolutely against. I'm just going to jump ahead here because you mentioned non-platforming and I want to pick up on that because a few weeks ago there's this 33-year-old tech editor for Breitbart News named Milo Yiannopoulos mm. who was disinvited exactly. from speaking at a grammar school for boys in Canterbury, UK, mm. a school that interestingly enough he himself attended. Mm. This non-platforming 
where you deny an invitation or cancel an invitation to those whose views you disagree with is happening increasingly at the places in the world where free speech is supposed to be most prized, our post-secondary campuses. Why is this happening so much these days? So I'm quite shocked. When I started working on this book 10 years ago, I thought to myself, you know, you're working in a university, Oxford and Stanford, which are temples of free speech, not a problem there, looking at the problems of free speech in the rest of the world. The last thing I imagined was that the problems would appear on campus. This is extremely worrying. I think we need to say no to no platforming. Uh, but, you know, and it connects actually to the point about echo chambers. So, in some measure, every childhood is a kind of echo, echo chamber. I mean, you hear the views of your parents, their friends, there's a limited range of views. When you leave university, you go back into another echo chamber, unfortunately. So, universities should be the places where you are faced with the widest possible range of views. And what's right? your sense about whether or not that's happening today? So I, I think the, 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 the trend is in the wrong direction. So you ask the question, why is it happening? Why are the children of some of the most privileged and free societies in the world going about this? There are a couple of explanations which are offered which are self-contradictory. One is, oh, we've mollycoddled them. They've been so overprotected, they're not used to being challenged. The alternative explanation is, they're exposed to all this filth and hate every day on the internet, <laughs> so they want to save space. Well, explanation one contradicts explanation mm -hmm. two. Explanation three is they've grown up in a world where liberalism was hegemonic, the world of the 1990s and the 2000s. Mm -hmm. To be young is to be against the prevailing orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. The orthodoxy is liberalism, so you, want, you kick against the pricks and the pricks are liberal, right? Mm -hmm. um, I am not utterly persuaded by any of these arguments. I think there's something to be explored there. But what I am sure about is that while we as professors, as faculty, um, should listen very carefully to our student concerns and address them where we can, including about the voices of the underprivileged, we should not allow student-on-student -student censorship. Do you know where that notion of kind of, which you can obviously do in a novel that you can't do in nonfiction, where did that notion of kind of playing around with reality, how, how did that come to you? Well, for me, I mean, um, I grew up wanting to write because of Marvel Comics and, you know, of late 70s and Stephen King. So my first acquaintance with literature is horror and science fiction. I was like a shut in watching The Twilight Zone. And so um, before I was introduced to uh, James Joyce and, and Hemingway uh, and Ralph Ellison. My idols were Arthur C. Clarke and, um, and Rod Serling and, and Stephen King. So fantasy is just a, a tool. I've, I've written books that are realistic, uh, books that are more overtly fantastic. Um, I think you find the right tool for the job and by not sticking to the facts, I was able to get to a larger American truth. So from the get-go in your head, this was always going to be historical fiction? Um, taking off from historical fiction. I mean, obviously, uh, if you have an underground railroad, you're altering things. <laughs> but luckily, I'm not in a historical novelist union. I'm not get kicked out for <laughs> breaking the rules. Did using that style somehow make it easier to tackle such a complex problem like race relations? Well, I, I, don't, have, I don't have to stick to how things actually happened. And so um, some people aren't aware of the Tuskegee syphilis experiments where you know, doctors experimented on, on African Americans. Um, I'm allowed to move these different things around uh, and make us think about them in, different, in a different way, hopefully. Um, and so that, that play allows me um, a lot more latitude to you know, spark people's different ideas in people's heads. We quoted something from very early in the book before. Let's try another quote now, this one closer to the end. Here we go. Color must suffice. It has brought us to this night, this discussion, and it will take us into the future. All I truly know is that we rise and fall as one, one colored family living next door to one white family. We may not know the way through the forest, but we can pick each other up when we fall and we will arrive together. Uh, that's a beautiful passage and very hopeful sounding. How much, of, how much of what your mission for this book truly is, is wrapped up in trying to get us all just to get along better. No, I mean, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> my mission, you know, people asked, you know, about 
some people see the book as hopeful, some people not so hopeful, and people have asked, like, I mean, it's crazy, but what's your solution to the race problem? And I'm like, I'm not uh, in the solutions business. I write novels, um, so I don't know. Um, you know, I, I write books to figure out things about myself uh, and other books about the world. And I think if you do it right, if you pick the right characters and situations and sentences, other people can come along for the ride. So um, I, in writing the book, I you know, have a different acquaintance with American history now. And if other people can see things differently, by the way, I juxtapose different elements. I think that's swell. And hopefully you're not bored. Um, so people become to books for different reasons. And I think if you're not bored and also think about uh, history and, and race in a different way, I think that's a, a fine goal. For I'm both. just feeling chippy enough not to let you get away with that answer. Because I can't imagine you writing this book with as much you know, brains and sensitivity as you did without assuming there's a bigger mission at play here beyond just the entertainment of the of the reader. You you want to solve the race crisis in society, do you well, not? Well, you know, the, the, sad, the sad thing is, <laughs> uh, I've written eight books, and sometimes people like them, sometimes they don't, sometimes they get good reviews, and sometimes bad reviews. And so, um, just as a matter of survival, I don't think about what happens after I hand it in. I hope my editor likes it, and my agent likes it. Um, but you never know. I mean, this the reception of this book is, has been great, and in doing readings, people are have been moved by Cora's story, and um, it is, you know, sort of sparking a conversation in, in ways I didn't envision. And it's great. Yeah. I feel I'm very fortunate. So. I'm interrupting you because I'm showing this. You wanna, <laughs> can you zoom in on the sticker here? Uh, that's what you get when the lady likes your book. Do you get to meet her? Um, I did meet her. I flew out to her compound uh, in Santa Barbara and we did a, a brief interview. And of course, it was, you know, it was a cloudy day and then the sun came out and a, a white dove. I flew on my soldier, <laughs> on my shoulder. None of this happened. None of that happened. <laughs> but I met her, and you know, obviously she's such an icon. Uh, ever since I was in high school, she's been such, this, you know, such a huge presence, and so it, it is surreal. And then people trust her word, and so a lot, I had such a, a different audience with this book. What happens when Oprah puts her book club sticker on your work? Well, uh, I have books that sound very odd if, in a two sentence description, and people might walk past them. When Oprah says, pick it up, uh, they do, strangely. <laughs> and so um, I definitely, it's a, a much bigger audience and it's led to a lot of word of mouth. And so in the months since it's come out, it's had a, a different life than I've experienced with other books. You were a little more forward than that before we started talking here. Before we went on camera, you said, it's changed my life. It's, it's changed, well, it's it changed has, my eh? life. How so? Yes. Um, well, you know, I started as a freelance journalist and I was, I, I've always juggled paying gigs with writing, and, um, and uh, back then it was, I would write an article, and that would buy me like three days of, of book time. And now um, a semester of teaching buys me like a month of, of book time. And so now, you know, with the su success of the book, I can um, just be, just you know, live off the writing for a while and uh, uh, plan my next book without switching back and forth between teaching and writing. And, and for, for me, someone who needs like a, a big block of time to work, that's a big sort of gift. So thanks, Oprah. <laughs> Your talk that you're giving at the Perimeter Institute is called Engineering Change in Medicine. Why did you decide to call it that? Well, I think uh, what we do is, first of all, we approach medical problems from an engineering perspective. And also, we know that in anything, plan B has to be different from plan A. You know, if you're going to try and change the way things are done, you have to have a new approach. And one thing that's exciting, I think, about the way we approach medical problems is we approach it from a very different perspective than our colleagues in uh, neurosurgery or, or, or stem cell biology. And through close collaboration with them, we can you know, try and answer questions that people haven't been able to answer yet or solve problems that people haven't been solved. Of course, everybody's trying to do mm -hmm. that, but by coming at this without perhaps some of the dogma that you have in traditional training, we think of you know, solutions or ideas and we test them out that some people might just discard because they're too crazy. Mm -hmm. But because we don't have that dogma, 
we're not afraid to try, you know, those crazy ideas, and, and sometimes they work. And how is personalization the future of medicine? Well, I think, you know, we have, you know, if we take cancer, for example, right now already we're starting to see personalized medicine with genomics. And what we're realizing is that, you know, not every medication is going to work for every person. And so really, if we're going to try and really push the needle and change the way human health is delivered, mm -hmm. um, we have to figure out what's going to be best for that individual. And it's not going to be the right thing for everybody. And how are you applying that personalization to cancer research? So what we're doing in cancer research is trying to figure out how to grow someone's cells in the lab. Mm -hmm. So currently, um, it's very difficult to grow patient cells in the laboratory. Either they don't grow or they grow in a way that doesn't represent how they grow in us. Because it's obviously a different environment. Completely different environment. Mm -hmm. Usually we're growing cells on hard plastic dishes. So first of all, that's 2D. Mm -hmm. And second of all, it's a hard plastic dish. So uh, what we're trying to do is grow those cells in an environment that mimics better how they grow in us or how they grow natively. And so First of all, we're working by growing them in 3D. Mm -hmm. We're 3D, obviously. And many of our tissues are soft, so we're growing them on soft material. So instead of a hard plastic, a soft, it's called a hydrogel. It's just a jello mm -hmm. is a hydrogel, just a water swollen material. And then providing them with an environment, you know, proteins, other uh, peptides, factors mm -hmm. that mimic. Uh, so they have the morphology, that they, they look the same as they grow in us. And then what we can do is screen a series of drugs on those cells grown in the lab versus basically screening them on us as patients. How could that change uh, for people who have uh, cancer? Well, ideally, if we can grow your cells in an environment that mimics the way they grow in us and test a series of drugs, then we can figure out which drug would be best for that individual before treating them. We do have um, mouse models mm -hmm. that people use where, where they will take a, a biopsy from a patient and grow them in what's called an immunocompromised mouse. So that's where the immune system has wiped out, been wiped out. But often it will take so long to get the answer. Mm. The patient has already been treated. So it's a, it's a, you know, we have to do things faster, um, but they also have to give us better outputs, right. you know, so better indication. It's fascinating. Um, <laughs> you also do this, though, for blindness. How do you apply personalization to blindness? OK, so we're working in two areas of blindness. Mm -hmm. One is related to age-related macular degeneration, and one is re uh, related to retinitis pigmentosa. Mm -hmm. And what happens in those two diseases? What is that? Those <laughs> yeah. Well, what happens is basically in those diseases, you either lose your central vision mm -hmm. um, or you lose your peripheral vision. In either way, your vision is drastically reduced. And so obviously, you can't see well. And so this is a progressive form of blindness. Mm -hmm. And what happens in those diseases is the cells at the very back of your eye in the retina, those cells degenerate. So what we're trying to do in blindness is design a strategy to replace those actual cells mm -hmm. that are lost in blindness. So, so does that stop the blindness completely or just delays it? Right. So currently, the way blindness is treated is with drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and the drugs work really well, but ultimately, they only slow the progression of the disease. What we're trying to do in this field is go beyond that. Yeah. Let's see if we can stop the disease. And more than that, let's reverse it. Can we actually give people their vision back? Can we restore vision? So this is um, a fantastic collaboration with Derek Vanderkoy's lab, where his lab has discovered stem cells that we all have in our eyes. And we're working with him, again, to deliver those stem cells in a way that they survive and that they integrate. And that is the Agenda's Week in Review. You can see all of those conversations in their entirety at tvo.org and on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit tvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.